Hello. Okay. I heard that over the last couple weeks or so, Pete at least told a joke up here. <laughs> that, that he tried to, you know, imitation is the sincerest form of flattery, Pete. So, you know, trying to tell a joke. That, that. So I'm going to have to tell two today. <laughs> there was an older faithful member who went to heaven. She's at the gates of St. Peter, and Peter's quizzing new arrivals. And he says, can you tell me God's first name? And she thinks for a moment, and she says, Andy. He says, Andy? Well, where'd you come up with that? And he said, we, we sang about it all the time. Andy walks with me, Andy talks with me. <laughs> I wouldn't have used that. You wouldn't have used it. <laughs> What are, what, what are people who are afraid of Santa called? Claustrophobic. Uh, claustrophobic. Christmas. Okay, I, I love Christmas time, guys. Who, who does not like Christmas? Anybody? Oh, somebody doesn't love Christmas. Has anybody wrapped, got all their presents or shopping done? Anybody got all their shopping done yet? Nobody? Has anybody? No, oh, you got it. You got it. Started shopping? Started shopping? Nobody started. Wow! <laughs> started shopping. I love I love the lights and the, the 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 caroling, the singing. I love the songs. The fact that Christ is is preached in public spheres. This is the only time of year where this really happens, where the gospel story, the Christmas story, is read and talked to about in in very public ways. Uh, in 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 with audiences listening to to the gospel being told. Uh, this is a good time of year. The Gospels are told in different ways, though, the way they tell the story of Jesus. Uh, the one that we're traditionally used to hearing uh, this time of year is Luke. And Luke begins his, his Gospel, actually, with the, the origins of, of John the Baptist and then with Jesus. Mark begins his, his Gospel uh, speaking about uh, the, the baptism of Jesus and, and then jumping into Jesus' ministry. John, of course, begins his gospel with the divine origins of where Christ comes from, that he was, he was before anything ever started. Matthew, on the other hand, introduces the story of Jesus with a genealogy. His first thing starts with a genealogy, tracing Jesus' lineage all the way back to, to Abraham through the line of King David, because the Messiah for the Jews must come through the royal lineage of King David. And Matthew does this to show his Jewish audience that Jesus does come from the right lineage. They were hooked on genealogy, the Jews. But we're not that different, are we? We can get our, our DNA tested. We spit in a little tube and we, we, through ancestry DNA, can find out all our ethnic origins. You want to find out more about that, you can ask Lynn Berry because she's, she's just done it recently. Uh, I, I, anybody wants a Christmas gift for me, I'm actually, it's on my wish list. AncestryDNA.com, you can get one of those. It's on sale for It's on sale, there you go. Give me. And, and, have you seen the commercials? Have you seen the commercials for AncestryDNA.com? You see them, there's one where the guy is, is German, and he's, he's into German dancing, and he's in a German dance troupe, and he's wearing lederhosen, and he does the AncestryDNA.com, and he finds that he's Scottish, so he trades in his lederhosen for a kilt. We're, we're, we're hooked on this, on this genealogy thing. It identifies who we are and where we come from, and, and, and the Jews were, were no different. Well, back in Matthew's day, genealogies were written uh, by the victors, okay? They were written, uh, the histories and the genealogies were written for the kings uh, by, by uh, people who made them look good. You had your genealogy. You had to make sure you, you looked good in your, in your genealogy, in your family history. And so this genealogy of Matthew's should be a royal announcement, right? It should be all the good things that have happened to all the people in his line, the, the stories that we pass along. Is, oh, yes, I'm, I'm related to this great king, right? We don't advertise if we're related to Hitler or Idi Amin. We don't do that. We don't advertise that. But we advertise that we're related to somebody famous and great. And yet Matthew highlights the creepy, almost R-rated stories in this genealogy. And you go, why? Why does he do that? Well, they're part of the story. These people are part of the story, and they're the point of the story. They're the point of the Christmas story. You see, up until this time, religious people has always been about, it always boils down to what can I do for God? What can I get from God? How can I get God to pay attention to me? What do I have to do or what do I have to avoid to get God to like me or to, or to not hate me? 
But Matthew's about to tell a story that's going to change that dynamic. He's going to tell a story of Jesus that's going to change that, and it changed it for him. Do you remember what Matthew was? Matthew the, the tax collector. Yes. And his story and the way that he got introduced to Jesus and what Jesus did for him greatly impacted him. And it impacts the way that he tells the Christmas story, the story of Jesus. Look at the, the way Matthew is, is uh, introduced to Jesus. He's, he's walking, Jesus is walking along and he sees Matthew and he's there at his tax collector booth. And Jesus says, come be my student, come follow me. And then, and then he gets to eat dinner with him and his scummy friends. Yeah, Jesus invites him to be a student, which at this time, imagine Matthew's surprise when he's asked to be a follower of this rabbi. A tax collector was a sinner. They were, they were traitors. They were, they were ones who were, it's, were unworthy to be in the polite, civilized society. And yet he's invited to be a student to learn from Jesus. And then Jesus sits with him and his other scummy friends down here to eat dinner. Imagine the surprise. This impacts Matthew because this is the Christmas story. His story is the Christmas story. Our story is the Christmas story. And so he tells this genealogist story of where Jesus comes from. And he goes out of his way to mention people in Jesus' line who were sinners. And they weren't just any sinners. They were sinners that we don't want our kids to be around. They were the ones who would win awards for most infamous. These were guys you don't share in your family reunion. Stories that you don't share with what happened. They were the shady characters. And so today and next week, we're going to look at a few of the shady characters that Matthew highlights in Jesus' family tree as he begins the Christmas story. Let's look at how he begins it. This is a record of the ancestors of Jesus the Messiah, a descendant of David and of Abraham. Abraham was the father of Isaac. Isaac was the father of Jacob. Jacob was the father of Judah and his brothers. Judah was the father of Perez and Sarah, whose mother was Tamar. Perez was the father of Hezron. Hezron was the father of Ram. Good sounding masculine name, Ram. Right away, Matthew tells people what he's doing. He says, this is an ancestry of Jesus, a des descendant of David, son of David, a term that he's going to link David closest to the Messiah. This is the son of David. He's the Messiah. But quickly, he goes where his Jewish readers reading this would not expect him to go. He goes, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, the three patriarchs of the Jewish religion, Abraham, the father of it, Isaac, Jacob, and Judah, <coughs> and his brothers. He picks out Judah. To a Jewish reader, this would jump off the page. Judah and his brothers. Judah, what do we know about Judah? We know a lot about another one of his brothers, Joseph. We could tell the story of Joseph, right? Even people who don't know the Bible, who aren't Christians, know about Joseph. Joseph and the Technicolor Dreamcoat, famous Broadway play. You know about Joseph and who Joseph was. He was persecuted, he was not treated right, but yet he ended up treating people very fairly. He becomes the savior of a whole nation. He makes much more sense to point to of a savior who's going to save people. He is the picture of a savior, and yet we have the father of Judah, Jacob, the father of Judah, and his brothers. Joseph doesn't even get mentioned in the genealogy, not even a word. He's a footnote in the story of Joseph. Judah's a little bitty footnote. Joseph has the longest story of any one individual in the book of Genesis. There are only, in fact, two brothers in the tribes of Israel who get mentioned in Genesis, Joseph and Judah. And Judah gets one little bitty chapter devoted to him. And he's just sort of a side note, an interruption in the whole story of Joseph. So why is Matthew mentioning this guy, Judah? When we first see Judah and his brothers, we see that they, they ripped his coat. They ripped Joseph's coat off him. They throw him into a well. You know the story. They ripped the coat off and they leave him in the well to die. And then, oh, they just go eat dinner. Throw our brother in a well. Let's just go eat. Let's go have a meal together. So that's where we find Judah when we first see him in Genesis. They're sitting down to eat. And, and they look up and they see the, the caravan of camels. And, and, and Judah all of a sudden says to his brothers, well, what are we going to gain? By killing him. What do we get by killing him? We have to cover up the crime instead of hurting him. Let's sell him to those Ishmaelite traders. After all, he is our brother, our own flesh and blood. And they do it. They sell Joseph to 
the Ishmaelite traders, and Joseph, of course, goes over to Egypt. And we know the story of Joseph, how he becomes a slave and works his way all the way up to become prime minister. But you see here, Judah is the influencer of his brothers. He's not the, he's not the oldest. Reuben is the oldest. Judah is the, the manipulator. He's the influencer. He's the one who seems to be able to get what he wants out of his brothers. And so we, we see Judah automatically uh, having a big impact on, on what, what, what happens to Joseph here. Maybe that, that's, because, that's why he, he goes off in the next chapter, the one little chapter where, where we see Judah. He's leaving home, and he goes and he becomes a shepherd, and he marries a, a wife. We get this interruption in the story of Joseph, and we learn about this incident with, with Judah living his own life over in, in Canaan. And he marries a, a woman, and they have three sons. And eventually he marries off his first son to a woman named Tamar. And the, we don't know what he did, but the first son ends up being uh, doing something wicked in the sight of the gods, all the Bible says, and he dies. If you want to follow this in Genesis chapter 38, where you find this story. And he finds this, this, uh, this appalling, and so the, well, he has to marry off his, his other son. This is the custom of the day, that when, you're, when your brother has a wife, you have to uh, marry, marry her to, to keep the, the family line going. So he takes his second son, and he marries Tamar. Well, then the, the Bible says that, that he was evil as well, and he dies. Well, now Judah's thinking, hold on, I've lost two sons to this black widow. What am I going to do? So he says, I'll marry the third son to you when he gets old enough. When he gets old enough, you can marry him. And he kind of forgets about it, not tending to do much with it. And years go by. The text says many years go by. We don't know. We don't know how long has passed. Okay? A lot of time passes over, and... We got to get the, his, his, his responsibility is to take care of Tamar as a patriarch. She's vulnerable. She's a widow. That's not good for her and her society. But years go by and nothing's been done. He's not marrying off the youngest son to Tamar. And one day he and his friend are out. Uh, they're, they're city elders of the city. And, and they go out. They go manage the sheep shearing. And someone tells Tamar, hey, your father-in-law's over there. He's going to look at the sheep. So she dresses up as a prostitute. A temple prostitute. And she goes out. She stands by the gate. She stands by the side of the road. And she waits for Judah to come. And eventually Judah comes. And he, and, he, and he sees her there. And this is a testament to how long it's been. And to how much he really cares about his daughter-in-law. Because he doesn't even recognize her. Doesn't even recognize her. And he says, well, can we go in here and have sex? You're a prostitute. And she says, well, what are you going to pay me? He says, well, I'll give you a goat. That's supposed to be the, the cost of that transaction for the day, the time, a goat. And he doesn't have a goat with him, and so she says, okay, well, what are you going to give me to promise that you'll give me a goat? And she, he says, oh, my, 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 rod, my, rod is, my rod and seal. So he gives her his rod and his seal. These are the things that display his status as a city elder in this, in this, in this town. So she takes that, they go over there, and they take care of business. He leaves, he goes back, and he gets, the, gets his friend and says, Will you take this goat over to this woman? She's nowhere to be found. She's gone. He says, Oh, well, okay, we, we got to keep this quiet. To avoid embarrassment, she's got my rod and staff, and, and I tried to give her the goat. I tried to give her what was hers, and she wasn't around, so let's just keep this between us. And goes on thinking nothing of it. Oh, this will, this will fade into history. Well, then three months later, what happens? Tamar turns up pregnant. And somebody comes running to Judah and says, Judah, your daughter-in-law, you remember the, the, the daughter-in-law you have? She's pregnant now. And what does Judah do? Judah does what somebody who is hiding a secret does. Somebody who has a secret always does. He acts self-righteous. He says, bring her out. Burn her at the stake. Let's burn her. She has shamed my family. We gotta kill her. Wait a minute, is this the same Judah who sold his brother into slavery 20 years ago? Is this the same Judah who broke his parents' heart, who had to watch them every time Joseph's birthday came around and, and weep for him because they thought he was, that he was dead? The same one that maybe left home to avoid seeing those faces? The same one who forced his daughter-in-law into poverty and shame? Is this the same guy? Now all of a sudden, oh, she's done wrong, let's burn her at the stake. And she comes and she says, wait a minute, 
The father of my child is the one who these things belong to. And he brings out the rod and the seal. And all of a sudden, he's like, oh, douse the flames. Let's we'll step back a minute. She says, he says, she is more righteous than I am. Because I should have taken care of her. And I didn't. You see, and then they have Perez. And Perez is in the line of Jesus. The son who never should have been in the line of Jesus from a story that doesn't make our family reunions, buried family secrets. But that's the point of the story. And yet Judah's story is not even over. He doesn't think he's ever going to see his brother again. Right? He never thinks Joseph's ever going to... He's a slave in Egypt. Twenty years go by, he's risen up to the prime minister of Egypt, and all of a sudden there's a famine in the land, and Judah and his older brother Reuben have to go and buy grain so that they can survive. And so, who's there doling out the grain when they get there? Brother Joseph, doling out the grain. And they don't recognize him. The brothers don't recognize him. He's, he's enculturated himself into the Egyptian culture now for the past 20 years. I mean, he dresses like an Egyptian. He talks like an Egyptian. He walks like an Egyptian. This is Joseph in culture. I got you. I woke you up in the team. That'll be. Joseph is entirely enculturated into Egypt. And he, and he comes and he sees his brothers there with grain and he goes, I know you, even though you don't know me. And so he goes through this whole thing, test him. He tests them. And eventually he sits down in a room with them quietly and he's at the table and, and he reveals who he is. And think about Judah. Judah's there and he's going, what would I do if I was in his position and he had sold me into slavery? Because I just said I would burn my daughter-in-law at the stake when I was the one who put her there. And he's looking at Joseph going, whoa, what are you going to do to me? And what does Joseph do to them? He forgives them. He saves them. Joseph is a picture of the Savior that Jesus is going to be. He forgives. He shows them mercy. He saves the nation of Israel. He saves the nation of Egypt. He saves Pharaoh. And yet Judah and his brothers are mentioned in the genealogy. Judah does nothing right, it seems, in these stories that we hear of him. But that's the point. When God chooses to enter into humanity, he says, I'm going to skip the Savior, I'm going to choose the liar and the manipulator. I'm going to choose the one with the past. My son's going to come through Judah. Matthew highlights this. He underlines this as part of the genealogy because these people are part of the Christmas story. And then he brings up another. And this other one isn't even Jewish. He continues on. Ram was the father of Abinadab. Abinadab the father of Nashon. Nashon the father of Salmon. Salmon the father of Boaz, whose mother was Rahab. Again, it was sort of a side note, Rahab. Boaz was the father of Obed, whose mother was Ruth. Obed was the father of Jesse. Jesse was the father of King David. So we made it to King David. From Abraham to King David. And we get this other little note here. So he doesn't have to put this. He does not have to mention her. Why is he doing this? Stick with the men. Stick with the men. Move on from Boaz to Obed. Boaz and Ruth actually a good story, a highlighted story that could, that could display some good stuff. Move on and get quickly to King David. Why are we having this stuff about mother of Rahab? What is this in here? Rahab had a label. You know who Rahab was? What is she called? Rahab the... Uh, prostitute, or if you're a fan of the KJV, the harlot. This is common. We label people. The Bible labels and nicknames people. Try this. John the? Uriah the? Hittite. Alexander the? Yes. Conan the? Jabba the? Oh. <laughs> Rahab the harlot, or the prostitute. She had a label. This introduces tension into the story again right away. Matthew's genealogy. They would, this would have jumped off the page to these Jewish people. That's Rahab the harlot. Oh, she's in the line of Jesus. Uh oh. Tension. Harlotry was something God had laws against for his people. She wasn't even Jewish. She's a Canaanite harlot. But she's in the line of Jesus. Why? 
Well, in case you don't remember the story of Rahab, I'm going to tell you. Israel's a nation. They've got laws. They've escaped from Egypt through the Exodus. And they're now a nation, and they're getting ready to enter the Promised Land. And jo Joshua, who's leading Israel now, Moses has died, and Joshua's leading him. He sends spies into the great city of Jericho, the fortified city. And they go to the house of Rahab. They're hiding in Rahab. And the king sends men banging on the door. We want to get these spies out. The king sends orders on what these men. Rahab defies the king of Jericho and says, I don't know where they are. She lies to the king and says they, they went somewhere else. And while she's hiding them, she goes up to him on the roof and she says this. The Bible says she tells him, I know that the Lord has given you this land and that a great fear of you has fallen on us so that we who live in this country are melting in fear because of you. The Lord, your God, is God in heaven above and on the earth below. Now then, please swear to me by the Lord that you will show kindness to my family because I showed kindness to you. This is where she uses different words for God here. The Hebrew text has Yahweh and Elohim. The Lord, Yahweh. Your God, Yahweh, the Elohim, is the Elohim. Yahweh is the God. She's declaring her faith in this God, the God. The spies promise to take care of her and her family if she helps them, helps them get out of this. And she does. She lets them down a window, and they escape, and they go back. And you guys know the famous story of Jericho that happens next, right? The famous story of Jericho. The walls come tumbling down. They go marching around the city six times, and then seven times, and seven times in one day. The walls come tumbling down, and the Israelites destroy everything. You might not remember that about the story, but read it in chapter 6 of Joshua. They destroy everything. The Bible says they kill every living thing in the city. They burn the entire city. They plunder the silver and gold. This is not a battle. It is a massive one-way slaughter by the Israelites. And in the midst of all this chaotic battle, one family is saved, Rahab and her family, because of the faith of one woman. She's saved. And then later it says, Joshua spared Rahab the prostitute, there's the lady, with her family and all who belonged to her because she hid the men Joshua had sent to spies, and she lives among the Israelites to this day. A reminder, the woman saved through faith, but she's still got the label. Rahab the prostitute, and she lives among them. She lives among them as a picture and a reminder to the Israelites of God's mercy and God's forgiveness, that he cares even about those outsiders. He cares even about the ones who are, who are against his laws, breaking his laws. This is, this is a woman who his laws say must be stoned. She's a foreigner. She's an enemy. She's done wrong, but he's now made her a part of his family. So much so that at some point, Salmon sees something beyond Rahab's past. He's a Jewish guy. He would have gotten together with her. He sees something past her. They marry, and they have Boaz. And Boaz is going to follow his father's lead and see something in a Moabite woman named Ruth. And they're going to get married, and together they're going to be the, have the grandfather of King David. See, Matthew knew that Rahab's story illustrates the Christmas story, illustrates Jesus' story. You see, because Judah is a picture of somebody who doesn't, who deserves something that he didn't get. Judah never broke. He never confessed. He never apologized for anything. And then at the pinnacle of the story, Joseph gives the opposite of what Judah deserved. Forgiveness, mercy, grace, love. God is available to people even who don't make themselves available to him. Rahab is a picture of a person pulled out of the wreckage by God pulled out of the wreckage, and invited to be a part of a family. A picture of an outsider and a lawbreaker who was shown God's mercy. You see, Rahab's story is our story. We have labels too. Ways that God can't take us seriously. Things that we think God can't take us seriously. We not, it's not Rahab the prostitute, maybe. How about Carlos the coveter? Or Gary the glutton? Or Lisa the luster? Or Charlie the cheater? No offense. <laughs> Jerry the jerk. Adam the addict. We have labels, right? She had a label. But he didn't tell Matthew, repent of your tax collect and then join me. 
He said, come join me. Come join me and be my follower. Take your darkness, pull it all in here with me, become part of my family. We'll work it out as we move forward together. Matthew knew this. It affected him. These stories of Judah and these stories of Rahab are there because Jesus came to, to invite the kind of people who are in his family. Creepy family members like Judah and Rahab are the point of the Christmas story. The story of Christmas is not just about Jesus. It's not only about the birth of Jesus. It's about the family that he comes from and what that means to the family that he has adopted. He didn't have twinkling lights. He didn't have carolers. He didn't have fancy presents. He didn't have a fancy meal. Christmas is about a Savior who came from a history and a long line of darkness into a dark world, into the darkness, to rescue us out of the darkness. That's, what it's, that's why we celebrate. That's why we celebrate Christmas. It's for people who have no joy. For people who think they can't approach God. But it was decided long ago, 4,000 years ago, when Judah and Rahab made the mistakes that they made, that God has always been pulling in those with secrets, telling them grace and mercy and forgiveness. It's a story that has been told over and over again, and with Jesus' birth, with God in the flesh, it got highlighted. That I'm going to do it. I'm going to show you forgiveness and mercy. I'm going to come down and take care of it. Christmas is God's way of repackaging an old message in the flesh of a real Savior. No one has access to the Father through their own goodness. Access to God has always been through grace, mercy, and forgiveness. That's why we see these characters in his genealogy, the story of Joseph, and Joshua, and Rahab. And that's what we've been reminded of at Christmas. And that's what we're all invited to now. To take part and partnership in the grace and forgiveness of God through his Savior, his Son, Jesus Christ. That's what we're all invited to now. Let's stand and sing.